All right, everybody, we're going to go and get started. There is a lot of ground to cover today. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of news as it pertains to <clears throat> uh, the DFAR 70 series with 7019, 7020, and 7021. Uh, but really today, um, this most applies to DFAR 7021 and some of the CMMC requirements. Um, obviously, there's some overlap here, but really, uh, we spun this webinar up mainly just to have uh, Richard join us and talk through the acceleration program, what's present day, what's at the by the end of the year, what's going to be next year. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces on this particular program, and we're really excited that Microsoft has continued to put a lot of emphasis on helping their clients and their customers meet compliance in the Microsoft 365 platform as well as in Azure. And so I'm really excited to bring Scott also from our team, because obviously this impacts how we provide services to, to our clients as well. And uh, and kind of talking through how to use these tools as a business, or if you uh, outsource any of any of your projects and efforts towards meeting CMMC and DFARS compliance, how to essentially use these tools uh, to the best of your abilities to meet these requirements. So hopefully we'll kind of address most of those. Again, feel free to shoot in questions. We'll try to get to those rather in the live talk or afterwards. But nevertheless, I'm going to go in intro and get out of the way here. So first off, we have Scott Edwards from Summit 7. He is the president and brings 20 plus years of experience uh, providing thought leadership around security and compliance and cloud services as a national speaker. Uh, this thought leadership has resulted in him being invited to participate in CMMC working groups and speak at other conferences throughout the DoD community. Before Summit 7, Scott spent six plus years working as a senior computer engineer uh, and NASA data center chief engineer. Scott is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and obtained a Master of Science in Computer Science from James Madison University. From Microsoft, we have Mr. Uh, Rich Richard Wakeman. Uh, Richard Wakeman is the Senior Director of Aerospace and Defense for Azure Global at Microsoft. He specializes in the DIB, adopting cloud services from Microsoft. Uh, Richard engages with Microsoft partners and clients uh, for end-to-end -end, uh, engineering and driving adoption for Azure Government and Microsoft 365, uh, GCC High DoD, and Dynamics 365, GCC High, as solutions within the Microsoft U.S. Sovereign Cloud. Richard uh, joined Microsoft in 2007 and has worked with hundreds of the most prominent worldwide accounts. So again, Richard and Scott, thank you so much. And I'm going to hand it over to Scott and Richard. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate it. And so we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get started here this morning. I'm really happy to have Richard with us. Um, Richard brings, obviously, a, a great deal of, of background and information uh, to us today. Um, as we get, you know, as we get ready to, to jump into this new world of the CMMC Acceleration Program and what that's going to do uh, for you um, as customers in the in the in the Gov Cloud, getting ready for um, DFARS and CMMC requirements. So we're really ex excited to have Richard today. So uh, what you can see now is the uh, the government platform is going to be the first thing we we'll talk about a little bit. Richard's going to kind of give the overview that he gives many times. Um, about the government platform, how it's how it's structured. I see we already actually have a question um, on the difference between the government platforms and and the commercial platform and such. And so Richard's going to address some of those actually uh, right away. Um, so Omar, you know you're in good shape. We're going to get that question answered right off the bat. So um, you know Richard, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and hand it over to uh, hand it over to you to uh, to jump into the uh, the next piece here. So. Okay. Let's jump in. Yeah, thank you for having me and hosting me today. This is a wonderful opportunity to, to, to present the uh, Microsoft uh, CMMC Acceleration Program. You know, in terms of looking at probably the, the most frequent question that we receive uh, from our defense industrial based customers is, is in alignment with which cloud they would choose, especially in protection of controlled and classified information. <clears throat> You know, in, in terms of looking at uh, the, the multiple clouds, I, I typically like to go through a, a quick history lesson in terms of how we ended up evolving our cloud services uh, to include multiple different data enclaves. You can see here that uh, that there is a build going on a little, little, um, a little ahead of uh, the, the dialogue. But if you look at, for example, the very first public multi-tenant offering that Microsoft made available uh, is working with our uh, education community and public sector community deploying our very first uh, productivity suite, which was back in the days of 
over 10 years ago with our business productivity online suite and what's now evolved into our Microsoft 365. And the enterprise offering is a global uh, multi-tenant solution where we offer data residency in multiple different uh, geographic locations around the world. This does meet a number of the requirements that we have uh, for jurisdictions that would span, for example, different industries as well as uh, government uh, and, and, and offer an ability to even do a multi-geo tenant to address uh, multiple different compliance requirements that you would have globally. Now, if you look at the Microsoft 365 Enterprise, it is a, uh, you know, a worldwide uh, solution. So you do have, for example, a follow the sun support model. Uh, you have uh, a global network and, of course, routing and so forth. And I get into quite a bit of the details of disseminating, you know, the differences between uh, how we would manage data residency within our commercial cloud versus what we'll introduce as we get into our government clouds uh, where we would introduce uh, true data sovereignty. Now, if you look at uh, the introduction of our government community cloud or what we oftentimes refer to as GCC, that came along about eight years ago, uh, in which case we, we had a gap in terms of being able to address the, the requirements for state and local government and primarily federal civilian agencies. So GCC is predominantly government entities that you would find uh, within that environment. And it was ultimately a region of the commercial multi-tenant environment, in which case we could be able to achieve, for example, a FedRAMP accreditation. Uh, we just announced that we do have a FedRAMP high accreditation within GCC, uh, and that's now paired with uh, what came along in terms of uh, an introduction of our Azure services uh, with infrastructure as a service and platform as a service uh, was introduced around the same time as GCC. Uh, so you'll find that there is a pairing between public multi-tenant GCC and Azure infrastructure as a service and platform as a service within the commercial multi-tent environment. Uh, so Azure commercial does has a, have a FedRAMP high accreditation as well. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, there's still a global network and of course uh, follow the sun support model around Azure commercial. And for certain components of uh, you know, GCC that are paired up with Azure commercial, uh, that really prevented us from being able to capture the, the uh, especially the U.S. Department of Defense, as well as some of the federal cabinet level agencies that had a true requirement for, uh, for example, uh, data sovereignty that's aligned with the no foreign. Uh, and that's where we introduced the uh, Azure government environment. There we go. Oh, so, Richard, yes. before we jump into the Azure Go side, you, you know, I would like for you to dive in a little bit on what you said about follow the sun support. Uh, can you explain a little bit about the, what that means with regard to um, the personnel who are involved in that support infrastructure and, and where that support actually comes from? Yeah, so so what, by way of example, uh, if you have an issue with Azure Active Directory uh, and you submit a support ticket, then you'll, you'll of course, get a, a support engineer that's aligned with uh, the Azure commercial environment, which would, in that case could be a support engineer that would be outside the continental United States. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you look at those support engineers, they by default do not have access to any customer data. Uh, so there is some controls that you can put into place like customer lockbox, but, the key, but because we do have uh, the ability for for nationals to, for example, do support of those systems like within Azure Active Directory, et cetera, it does prohibit Microsoft from being able to provide a contractual obligation to no foreign, uh, which would align with us being able to say that we can give you a contractual amendment in GCC to protect, uh, you know, ITAR uh, QE that is, is ultimately uh, uh, in alignment with export control data. That's where we introduce the uh, Sovereign Cloud. Okay, great. Thank you. So looking at Azure Government, uh, we built that about approximately five years ago and primarily in support of the U.S. Department of Defense. It was initially built out as a, a DISA Security Requirements Guide Impact Level 5 environment. Uh, it also gave us a base foundation to begin delivering 
additional services within what I'll call the U.S. sovereign cloud. Uh, so if you if you just step one one forward in the build, you'll notice that we built a cloud for the productivity suite, which is Office 365 Department of Defense or DoD. And this cloud was built to a, an SRG Impact Level Five control set, uh, as well as FedRAMP High. And uh, ultimately, the DoD environment is restricted to use by only those networks, federal information systems that are managed by the U.S. Department of Defense proper, uh, which prohibits even some of the federal cabinet level agencies from being able to have access to that environment. So what we did is we built a, a twin copy of the U.S. DoD uh, Office 365 productivity suite and that's what you'll find is now branded Microsoft 365 GCC High. Uh, now, what you'll find is that the that, that, uh, GCC High environment is managed through a, a, an SRG Impact Level 5 control set. We'll oftentimes label it as uh, you know, IL-4 equivalency by virtue of the fact that uh, most of the customers that would be within that environment are more in alignment with an IL-4 as opposed to an IL-5. Uh, of course, for the defense industrial base, uh, there's not a specific requirement that you would have for the SRG. Those are for federal information systems, and that's where we align with, for example, the requirements for the, the for the DIB to include uh, DFAR 7012 as well as uh, NIST 8171 coverage. And we'll go into that in a bit more depth as we go through our presentation today. But don't get tripped up by by branding. Uh, what you'll find is that uh, oftentimes, we'll refer to branding of Azure for the infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, whereas uh, software as a service is, is branded GCC High in this in the sovereign cloud. So there are services in Azure government, such as Azure Active Directory, that are truly sovereign to the United States with only managed by screened uh, U.S. persons. In which case, uh, you know that that uh, Azure Active Directory instance in Azure government is branded GCC High. So oftentimes, GCC High and, and Azure government are interchangeable in terms of branding. And uh, in, in, in looking at that's why I differentiate. Oftentimes, everything that you see on the right side of this chart would be our U.S. sovereign cloud, versus the left side would be more of our public multi-tenant environment. Great, thanks. That's a, a really good overview, and I think that uh, you know most of the people watching, some many of them may have seen some of this before, but you know this is always a great you know, great topic to to cover, um, especially as we start jumping in to talk about you know some of the next items that we have on the list here. So, so next we have the shared responsibility model. Um, so obviously, as we are uh, deploying out for these compliance requirements in the Microsoft Cloud, uh, there's a shared responsibility model, um, you know, between the organization that is deploying in the infrastructure and then Microsoft. And so, Richard, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how this shared responsibility model works with regards to NIST 8171 and, you know, even NIST 8053, you know, for those organizations that need, you know, that kind of uh, that kind of control set? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, oftentimes what we'll refer to as a shared responsibility model would be a set of controls that, of course, you can inherit natively from the Microsoft platform, assuming that you're in a cloud native configuration, uh, and as well as those that are shared scope of responsibility or an organization only responsibility. Uh, the, of course, the the amount of that pie chart, if you will, will will change depending on whether it's software as a service or naturally infrastructure as a service has a greater scale of number of controls that would be owned by the organization responsibility. I like to put it really into three different categories, right? There, there are, in, in context of the cybersecurity maturity model certification, you know, there's 130 practices for CMMC level three. And of those, there's only a, a, a few, like approximately 15% that you can natively inherit from the Microsoft platform. Those are mostly physical controls. And in your system security plan, of course, you can be able to uh, document uh, that, that Microsoft would have coverage of those, especially those physical controls, in which case solutions are deployed on the cloud. 
uh, as opposed to, you know, of course, you'd still have to document the, the your on-premises environment as well. Uh, but to to look at um, the vast majority of those practices, approximately, you know, 60% are uh, ones that are shared responsibility between Microsoft and the organization, right, the, the tenant owner. So by way of example, there's a lot of access control uh, practices within CMMC, of which case we provide capabilities, right, in order for you to be able to demonstrate compliance for those specific specific practices and we'll provide you know of course prescriptive guidance on how you would do that and provide solutions for example uh, for our for our partners to be able to, to extend to you uh, but it's still your responsibility to configure those in, in a compliant fashion and to go and demonstrate compliance to for example an assessor for a, uh, a CMMC audit and then of course what you see left over there's a lot of there are many processes that are aligned with CMMC that simply would be 100% of the organization's responsibility. Now, if you, if you flip forward one more slide. I can, there you go. Uh, the, the amount of your shared scope of responsibility will be different depending on, as I mentioned, if you are deploying infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, as opposed to software as a service. Naturally, with, with Office 365, the port the, the PUT is uh, considerably shorter, but then there's still a, a vast amount of uh, customer responsibility to, for example, configure access control, as I mentioned, uh, as well as uh, device management, et cetera, to, uh, to control access into the software as a service environment. So the, to net it out, uh, you know, what we have been focusing on with the CMMC Acceleration Program is to maximize the coverage for cybersecurity maturity model certification level three uh, and above, right? Because level one is, of course, more process oriented. Once you get into level three, that's where you have the alignment with NIST 800 -171 in which case we would be able to, uh, for example, map out how the capabilities of our service will help you to, uh, you know, to, to meet your compliance requirements using Microsoft technology for those shared scope of responsibility. Uh, and we've got, you know, of course, uh, quite a bit more investments in, in IaaS here initially, because there is a, a larger scope for, for infrastructure as a service. Very Great, good. thanks Richard. So. As we as we are about to you know flip into talking about the acceleration program in you know in specific, can you address a little bit you know, about you know as we go through this you know the percentages you know with 800-171 and the CMMC you know level three requirements for 130 you know 130 different practices that are there, mm -hmm. um, you know obviously a, a significant portion of those are you know on Microsoft from a responsibility standpoint um, you know with the infrastructure and there's a, a larger posi uh, position that's really going to be uh, about configuration. And now with the acceleration program, we're going to have a portion of those uh, that may be configured through, you know, through the acceleration program uh, to help, you know, to help people get, you know, further down that road toward a compliant configuration, right? That's kind of the whole goal. So if you could, uh, you know, just address, you know, you know, in general numbers of controls, if you, if you have that kind of information, that would be great. Yeah. yeah, one of the one of the deliverables that we have that I'll present here in a moment is our product placemat, uh, and the 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 uh, what this illustrates is the ability for you to map all the Microsoft capabilities and products to become uh, compliant, running in the Microsoft cloud, and in, in some cases even for hybrid deployments that would extend to on premises and to other cloud service providers using our suite of, for example, security and compliance tools. Now for those, if you maximize those numbers, what we found is there's approximately 70% coverage, most of which is shared responsibility model between Microsoft and the tenant owner or the customer. So, you know, the vast majority, as I mentioned, but you still get, if you, for, for example, if you went all in with Microsoft technology and you used a a Microsoft 365 E5, and you, you leverage the capabilities that we have within uh, Azure and Office 365 for uh, compliance 
uh, that, that you would be able to get approximately 70% of the way there with guidance, right? But we, we know that closing the gap, A, to get through that configuration to the 70% plus closing the gap to 100% is going to be customer responsibility, in which case we would rely heavily on our partner community and have been working and, and ultimately building the CMMC acceleration program and intention to be scaffolding for, uh, for our partners and our customers, but many of our specially managed service providers that we know are required to be able to uh, scale to the, the, the sheer numbers of the defense industrial base, especially you know, going into the small, medium sized market uh, with the tier three in the supply chain, uh, that there's just such vast quantities that we're looking to have and enable our partner community like Summit 7 to be able to address and help with a lot of that configuration to the 70% plus the processes beyond that to close the gap. Yeah, that's, that's really great. And so, there are so many companies that have to move in, in into you know these compliant infrastructures, and you know everything that we can do working together. You know as we've been working with you on the on the acceleration program for the last few months, you know anything that we can do that's going to speed that process for 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 the dib is going to be you know obviously well received. Um, and so that, I'm really excited about about what we have here, and uh, and you know uh, I'm really excited about getting this out you know out for customers. So. Yeah, likewise, it's been wonderful working with Summit 7 and helping to, uh, you know, to really steer where Microsoft helped, you know, helping us to, to, to even put some of these uh, CMMC acceleration program artifacts together. If you look at uh, the blogs that we have uh, published, uh, those are available, uh, links on the slide here, as well as if you go to uh, my LinkedIn page or to our Microsoft tech community for public sector, where most of these blogs have been published. Uh, one of the very, the very first, call it table stakes, that we have uh, with the Microsoft CMMC Acceleration Program is to work with our partners in the, the uh, CMMC accreditation body and various other stakeholders for CMMC for us to define and have an agreement on what the program of reciprocity will be from the cloud service provider. As you know, if you look at NIST 800-171A, and as written, many of the controls with, with NIST, as well as even with the CMMC practices, uh, do not have many accommodations for a CSP or for cloud use. Uh, so we've been going through this process of looking at, well, what, what's the best way for us to establish reciprocity so that you can inherit from us, so that you can be able to have compliant solutions that leverage the underlying platform and so that you can be able to, to accelerate, for example, an assessment with a CM, CMMC C3PAO audit, because uh, you know there's certain aspects of the underlying cloud platform that you, as a customer, shouldn't have to go in and uh, one at a time have to assess the the cloud service provider. So we would establish that reciprocity for you to be able to inherit that. Naturally, DFAR 7012 has. Uh, a, a strict requirement for uh, a FedRAMP moderate accreditation, uh, which we hold a FedRAMP high uh, provisional authorization within Azure, all of Azure, uh, commercial and government, as well as now FedRAMP high uh, within our government clouds, uh, including GCC and GCC high. So we meet that, that, that benchmark that's required uh, for reciprocity for NIST 8171 and DFAR 7012 requirements of a cloud service provider. Uh, now, if you look in, in uh, the, the data protection that's required for controlled and classified information, that's where you get into an alignment oftentimes with the uh, Department of Defense Cloud Computing Security Requirements Guide. And uh, if you look at our government clouds, we do have SRG alignment and we can demonstrate compliance, for example, with SRG impact level five in our US sovereign cloud, including, uh, you know, looking at the equivalency for IL-4 and GCC high. So that does have the, call it the higher watermark for compliance uh, that you can be able to demonstrate for protection of controlled and classified information, especially paired together with in the US sovereign cloud of us having a uh, contractual obligation for ITAR, right? So yeah. those are, of course, all things that we can demonstrate and our customers can leverage, right? Yeah, that's that's really great. 
Now, if we if we step forward into the CMMC acceleration program uh, intention, as, as I mentioned before, we have been targeting CMMC level three initially. We will, of course, go to uh, full level five as more details uh, emerge, especially from the accreditation body and from DISA uh, that are that are still working on assessment guides, etc. Um, the 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 intention initially is to have, of course, as I mentioned, scaffolding for our partners to build managed solutions on. Uh, so that would give uh, capabilities, establishing the reciprocity, et cetera. Uh, for the intention that, that uh, Microsoft working with our partners can be able to, to deliver pre-configured environments. And if you look at that pre-configured environment, that may be uh, you know, a fully hosted environment uh, where you would lift and shift an entire organization into the cloud, uh, call it a you know, cloud native solution for an entire company, uh, versus there's also opportunities to build out shared data enclaves. Oftentimes I call them mission enclaves. This may be a, an environment that's hosted, for example, by uh, one of the DIB tier one prime contractors where they would have a control environment that would, would uh, uh, control data egress so that they can invite in their supply chain right within that environment and be able to uh, you know meet the higher bar for compliance not necessarily eliminating those uh, you know subcontractors from having to go get CMMC themselves they will need to uh, but it does enable for example especially once you start introducing the higher levels uh, four or five, where these did, uh, prime contractors simply would have a higher level of requirements for these mission clouds. So they're ultimately yeah. segmented environments uh, um, that, that you yeah. can code. I mean, we see that with our customers today. Um, we're seeing more and more traction, more customers asking for an enclave type approach, especially the larger businesses. You know, smaller businesses are typically going kind of all in, like you were saying earlier, right? Uh, but but the larger businesses, many of them um, are, are starting to build out enclave approaches, especially leveraging things like Windows Virtual Desktop in mm -hmm. Azure um, to uh, to have kind of that fully, you know, full desktop environment sitting in Azure, uh, leveraging Office 365 and the rest of the Azure services and basically um, separating it out from, from you know, some of their um, on-prem infrastructure and such. So it's definitely an approach that I see more happening more more often uh, with our customers, and, and I think we're going to continue to see that um, that method of, of, of uh, configuration. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, if there's if you could go on for probably hours on the topic of whether or not you go all in, or if you uh, decide to swivel seat, as I call, where you have uh, two different panes of glass, and of course uh, control uh, data transfer between environments uh, that would protect controlled and classified information, especially important for Covered defense information, technical documentation that would right. be export controlled. You know, one of the things that you brought up a second ago, um, you know, as you see here that, you know, we're currently targeting CMMC level three with the acceleration program as it sits today, right? Um, but you brought up CMMC level four and level five, and especially from an enclave standpoint, you know, supporting, you know, down level, uh, down level subcontractors to be able to get access to a level four, level five environment. That's certainly an area that I think that, you know, you're going to see primes moving into. Um, and, you know, we've done some analysis of the platform, you know, obviously some of that with you and you know, we see no blockers right now within the Microsoft cloud to be able to get to level four, level five within the Microsoft cloud. Have, have you run across anything that you think that um, may be a hurdle um, at this point for level four, level five within uh, the Microsoft Go cloud? No, not at all. I mean, we already achieve um, a higher level of, of obligations and you know standards and compliance that that would even exceed a, a level five. There's some unique aspects to to uh, you know especially level five that we believe will be a, a significant concern for our customers, uh, which is why there's you know a, a this this run to uh, you know partner up and and make sure that there's a, a whole community to support our customers out there. For example, once you get into a level five, you have a very strict requirement for, uh, you know, for real real time monitoring and having a, a security operations center, a SOC, and many of the smaller companies, even medium sized companies, to stand up a SOC is less than trivial. Right? Absolutely. I mean, with level four and level five, really the biggest piece is around people and process. It's really not even the technology at those levels. It's it's really do you have the right people doing the right processes 
threat hunting, um, you know, investigation, those kinds of capabilities that that really sets level four and level five apart. Yeah, for certain. And leveraging capabilities of our platform, such as uh, you know Microsoft uh, Azure Sentinel, that's our SIM and source solution, play a very significant role in those SOCs and in, in those real-time monitoring and threat hunting, et cetera. So we're, you know, we, we've been making investments, for example, into building out uh, uh, workbooks that align with CMMC that are available within the uh, Sentinel. And, and that works across both Azure and Office. Uh, so looking at uh, some of the w announcements that we've made here in our, our recent uh, blog is around the Microsoft Compliance Manager. We're really excited about this. Uh, it went general availability for the first time just this last um, uh, month in October aligned with Ignite. And inside of, you think of m the Microsoft Compliance Manager as being a GRC tool that we have built into our Microsoft 365 uh, Compliance Center. So it has coverage over the Microsoft 365 product suite. That's uh, of course the, product, the, the productivity suite with Office 365, as well as many of our security products like, such as uh, Intune and MCAS uh, Cloud App Security uh, that we have uh, as part of our security suite and Azure Information Protection. Uh, and we have the ability to uh, for example, overlay a set of assessment templates into the compliance manager. So those assessment templates are uh, a set of, uh, of templates that would define the rules in alignment with each of the, the um, you know, controls or practices in the case of CMMC that you would need to configure in order to raise your compliance score. So there's both a, a, a set of actions that you would take by way of example, uh, one of the uh, the actions for CMMC in this 8171 is you must implement uh, multi-factor authentication and enforce it across the entire uh, tenant. So there is a, a, a you know a, a set of guidance where you point you to, for example, Azure Active Directory to configure a conditional access policy that will enforce MFA. And if you do so and you complete that successfully, then it's going to raise your compliance score. Uh, now, I will just caution you that the compliance store score today is something that's fairly arbitrary based on the developers of the assessment templates. Uh, we have had some interest in some open discussions now to looking at how that compliance score could be weighted better in alignment with the NIST 800-171A uh, assessment guide so that, uh, that those could align. Uh, as, as we speak, we have the assessment templates for NIST 800 as well as CMMC levels one through five. Uh, and we, of course, would embrace any feedback that you would have as you begin to use these. Uh, now, it is limited to commercial, but the good news is, is that the team that, that manages the compliance manager has uh, committed to deploying this within the government clouds by the end of this year. Uh, it may even surprise us with uh, early release here this month in November. Uh, so that would become available within Microsoft 365 uh, GCC High uh, by the end of this calendar year. So, Richard, a couple questions on that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, that the uh, the scoring, you're looking at doing some weighting with that. Are you going to make that weighting, you know, match kind of the DIBCAC, uh, the DIBCAC process around, you know, you know the uh, the scoring that we have for the moderate the medium and the high assessments that DCMA would be would be doing, um, or are you looking at you know just straight eight hundred one seventy one? How how are you looking at potentially making that uh, that work out? Uh, it's early in the discussion. I would say we're we're very malleable on that front and open to feedback. Uh, the one thing that that I will call out is that you know these these assessment templates do not have full coverage of any one practice in many cases where there's still a shared scope of responsibility by the customer. Uh, and, you know, so any score that you would see coming out of the compliance manager would be mostly partial in contribution to, a, to most of the practices, right? Like it, it shows and demonstrates where you are uh, doing the right configurations within your tenant to meet those those compliance requirements per control, uh, but keeping in mind that there still is uh, 
shared scope of responsibility even beyond that that you would yeah. have to be accountable it, for. Can you just dive in a little bit on that? Because you know, one of the things on the on the previous slide, if we could go back real quick, um, you know, there's a difference between configuration and you know configuration versus reporting. And how mm -hmm. does you know how does compliance manager uh, fit within that scope? Um, you know, does compliant does compliant compliance manager allow you to actually do one click configuration, or is it more of a reporting tool, basically uh, showing you what you have configured in your environment? Yeah, it's more of a reporting tool at this point. It is tied into a real-time configuration of your tenant. By way of example, if you've enforced MFA, then it would show you a real-time, uh, you know, reporting, but also, you know, have uh, a, a, an ability for you to one-click go and enable multi-factor authentication. That may be, a, a, you know, acceptable for... Uh, that default rule by many organizations, especially small, and medium size. But we all know that there's, especially within the defense industrial base, exceptions to that MFA rule, such as if you're using Windows Hello for Business on Windows, or if you're using another third-party provider such as Duo uh, for multi-factor on Mac and Linux, or you know wherever else. That uh, naturally, a compliance manager is not going to report back on what your configuration is on Duo. So, absolutely, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but it is—it's very valuable. I mean, it's—we've gotten really good feedback, and would love to continue to evolve that. <laughs> now, the Azure Security Center is, um, is is similar to the Compliance Manager, but the Azure Security Center is part of Infrastructure as a Service and Platform as a Service. Uh, we've now rebranded this into Azure Defender. Uh, within Defender, we have the ability uh, to, to be able to present what are called Azure Blueprints. Uh, blueprints are a set of policy initiatives as well as automations through such as a uh, you know, resource manager uh, you know, scripts and templates that you can be able to apply to a, an Azure subscription. And uh, similar to the compliance manager, it results in a, a view you know, reporting back to you on how you would achieve you know, very specific controls and how they're configured on, for example, virtual machines or virtual network uh, within Azure. Uh, so they're, they're synonymous, you know, the Azure blueprints are similar to, to Azure as uh, the assessment templates and compliance manager applied to the software as a service world with Microsoft 365. Uh, we do have currently a Azure blueprint sample for NIST uh, 800 that you can, can, can apply to uh, subscriptions in both Azure Commercial and Azure Government. Today, we have, as part of this acceleration program, uh, are building a CMMC Level 3 Azure Blueprint that we'll actually preview next week. Uh, so we're beginning the, the previews for that. We, we will go into a public preview next month in December. Uh, we have no line of sight on general availability, though, for any CMMC Level 3 uh, deliverables that we have until I believe we will probably get through the whole provisional period with, uh, you know, the assessments that, that are being done, uh, especially for Level 3, because there's still a lot of unknowns out there. But we'll, you know, we'll continue to, uh, to evolve these blueprints and, and assessment templates uh, as we learn more about how uh, CMMC level three will be uh, ultimately assessed. That's great. So from an infrastructure standpoint, which is what the, you know, the Azure piece really does. So, you know, laying down these boot blueprints is going to allow us to quickly configure an environment, um, at least a minimal environment to some percentage of configuration, say what, 50, 60% of configuration for CMMC. Is that kind of what the target is? That is the target. Yep. It is. Right. And, you know, of course, a holistic solution would, would require components that are over in the Microsoft 365 side. So if you deploy an Azure uh, blueprint, for example, that would uh, apply to an Azure subscription for virtual networking and virtual machines or Azure SQL, et cetera, you would still need to have uh, you know, coverage, for example, of the Microsoft 365 suite. Uh, that would include device management through Intune, making sure that any of the devices that are connecting into your network are, are trusted devices and currently in policy, for example. 
Yeah, you know, I tell you, as we have done, you know, hundreds now of these implementations and, you know, you know, to to the CMMC or NIST standard 171 standard and the migrations into the platforms, um, you know, that is really the sticky point, you know, that we run across every time. It's it's migration and device management. You know, those mm-hmm. are the two big ones. Those are the two difficult places that it takes so much time and so much effort to to get correct because you start touching users and you start touching user data. And when you start touching your users and you start touching your user data, um, that's where that's where a lot of the time comes in. So um, it's certainly something that has to get a lot of uh, a, a lot of attention. It sure does. In fact, I would say one of the big differences in the, the defense industry, especially the DIB, is compared to many of the customers that I've worked with. You know, gosh, I've been doing migrations to Office 365 for over 13 years, or the previous technologies before that. Uh, and and uh, oftentimes you would evolve into a state where you would say, hey, our goal is to get to a point to where we would only allow access by trusted devices and people that are connecting from, you know, you know trusted networks or some combination of, of conditional access controls. Whereas the DIB have a very strict requirement that you have to come right out of the starting gate with enforcing these rules, especially in protection of controlled unclassified information. Uh, so there isn't an option to say we're going to get there. We have in our POAM that we're going to start managing all of our devices. No, all your devices have to be managed now. Right, absolutely. Be compliant, which is where zero trust comes into play. If you look at zero trust, you know, the whole principle here is to, to, to never trust and always verify. So if you want to go and get access, for example, to some uh, data repository or application uh, hosted in Azure, for example, that may contain controlled and classified information, then nobody may have access to access to that data as a standing concern. It may be that the only way that they can get access to it is through some sort of uh, you know privilege workstation or through uh, a trusted device, as I mentioned, maybe even trusted networks, etc. So the zero trust model is really something the Department of Defense has been embracing. Uh, we, we are also making significant investments across Microsoft and, of course, within Azure Global to deliver a zero trust architecture. And we, we have already uh, uh, pr- uh, built a number of automations that are available for p- applying an Azure Blueprint to a, an Azure subscription that is available as a, a repo on GitHub. I've linked to it here as well as into my blog. Uh, I'll just say that we have a major refresh of that coming next month. Uh, so the, the zero trust architecture is being developed in coordination with our Microsoft design for zero trust, much of which is in alignment with the NIST uh, definition as well. Uh, now, I've, uh, because there's been such a moving target with CMMC special level three, uh, I haven't yet mapped the, uh, the zero trust architecture blueprint to CMMC level three. So our our intent is to go ahead and release this zero trust architecture next month. And then we'll do an exercise in uh, the first half of uh, 2021 to then go and and fine tune it and provide documentation that will be specific for CMMC. Product placemat, super excited about this. We have it coming out in preview uh, next week as well. So the, pre- the product placemat is, think of it as our uh, consolidated set of guidance around the cybersecurity maturity model certification. Uh, the level three placemat that I have a screenshot of here is an interactive uh, user interface. So it's not static. In fact, I've had some people say, hey, can you give me a, a better screenshot of this? And I'm like, well, actually, the placemat is not just a screenshot. It is literally the ability for you to um, you know, be able to identify how Microsoft products would be able to contribute to compliance across all the different uh, families of, of CMMC practices. Uh, and there's also a mapping that's inherently built in here for NIST 800 as well. So that schema for CMMC, of course, is uh, what's represented in the periodic chart, but you'd have a crosswalk into NIST 800 as well. And uh, illustrated here, you can see that this is the maximum set of uh, Microsoft products, in which case, you know, we are able to achieve, uh, you know, over 70 percent 
of uh, CMMC practice coverage. Now that that is a shared scope of responsibility in, in, in almost all these controls. If you were to reverse out, so this is the maximum using, for example, Microsoft 365 E5 SKU. If you were right. to uh, look at a view of it with no products applied, then it would be closer to like 17% as opposed to over 70%. Yeah, this is a great product and, you know, kudos uh, for the work that's been done on this. Um, you know, like you said, 70% coverage within the product stack, if everything is configured appropriately, obviously there's shared responsibility there, right? So, you know, while Microsoft does a lot of the infrastructure pieces, the customer still has to, you know, do a lot of configuration here. And, you know, th that 70% maps to, you know, I'm thinking back to, to, to kind of the bigger map, you know, there's still over, you know, I think it's 12 to 1300 different configuration items, um, you know, when you look across all those, all those products. So, you know, there's a significant amount of stuff behind that product placemat that really, uh, uh, that really has to get done uh, from a shared responsibility model standpoint. So, but this is a great product and this is going to be great for, uh, for our customers uh, to, to be able to get a better view of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and it has customer implementation guidance also built into it. We'll distill that out into a mini SSP that our customers can leverage um, as well. So if you look at the, uh, the cybersecurity reference architecture quickly, this is just a single visualization of all of our, especially our security suite and how that applies for identity access, information protection, you know, client management, uh, et cetera. Uh, we do have a new version of this that will be aligned with all the rebranding that we did, especially around the Defender uh, that will be coming out here in a couple of weeks as well. So uh, great, great tool. I think of the this reference architecture as being like a, a level 100 view versus the, the product placemat would be a level 200 view with more depth. And then, of course, getting into the reference architectures that are paired with documentation such as system security plans, et cetera, would be the level 300 and above, right? It would be getting down to the nuts and bolts. Again, the re even with the reference architectures, are in, they're still uh, paired together with, with customer scope of responsibility for those. So a lot yeah, of great. Many questions, too, so I'm not sure how much time we have. Left yeah, here. so I've got a few more slides I'm going to go through here, and then we're going to jump into some questions. There has been a very active uh, set of questions come through. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but we will try to get to some of them. Um, and we will follow up with those that we're not able to get to. We'll follow up with those offline so that um, so that we get answers to everybody who did ask questions um, where possible. So, so where does this leave us? I mean, you know, Richard, you've gotten, you know, you've added – um, you know, fuel to the fire here, right? Um, you've gotten a lot of people excited about, you know, what this capability is going to be, um, how it's going to help the DIB really get secure in the Microsoft Cloud, uh, which is all of our goals, right? Uh, we want to make sure that, that the DIB can do that as quickly and as easily as possible. And so where do we go from here? Um, so what is the bottom line? Uh, Microsoft is investing. Uh, it's investing in the support of this infrastructure in the in the government and infrastructure to to protect the government data. Um, they have gone above and beyond, in my opinion, on what they've done with things like the acceleration program and and the work that you've done, Richard, and your team has done. So I think that's great. Um, there are tools in this package that are being released. All of these are tools that can be used. There are no silver bullets here, um, but it is a set of tools that can be used uh, to help speed your way in uh, to the platform, help you uh, secure the environment um, and do it in a way that maybe it, it cuts your time to deploy down a, a little bit. Um, there's going to be more, just like Richard said, coming out in 2021. Um, obviously, the placemats coming out. Uh, there's there's new Azure blueprints coming out, um, and there's going and these products are going to continue to get revved as we go through the year. And then, you know, toward the end of this year, we're going to have the uh, all of this the compliance manager being pushed into GCC High, which everybody's going to be very excited to see, I'm sure. Um, it, it it is a, an ongoing and maturing effort. You know, Richard, you know, what would you say? When we get to this time next year, what would you say that this product is going to look like at that point? Yeah, the way I think of the acceleration program is instead of it being a, a product in and of itself, it's really a collection, as you see, of, of many different tools. In fact, it's been a, a, a cross-team effort. Uh, naturally, I'm within Azure Global, and most of the work that I would deliver with our teams are very specifically aligned with, with Azure Infrastructure as a Service and Platform as a Service, right? So we're working and joining together 
uh, with, for example, the Office product group and the security product group and, and Microsoft Consulting Services and various other uh, organizations across Microsoft to really pull together this collection of resources. So you'll, you'll find that uh, as we continue to evolve this program into next year, that uh, especially as we get more clarity on how uh, CMMC Level 3 will be assessed, what you'll see is we'll continue to refine the reference architectures and especially the documentation that gets paired with it. So by this time next year, we, sh we should be able to say that we have, uh, for example, a mini uh, SSP that would be the configuration of your environment on the Microsoft platform and uh, that would be, you know, ultimately close this, close the gap, or be the what we like to cry, try and call the easy button to help uh, accelerate to getting through an assessment for CMMC level three, or the, of course, NIST 871A uh, right. assessment as well for for registration and SBRS. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, that is going to be a great help when you start talking about taking, you know, the configuration, you know, with this SSP output, if you will, and it's really an input is what it is. It's an input into your actual SSP. Um, it's not going to be a, a case where you're going to be able to take that deliverable and turn that over to an assessor and say, here's our SSP, right? Um, it's, it's an input into your overall organizational SSP for the, uh, for the system as it's scoped. And so that's kind of brings us to the next slide I hear of is, what do you have to do beyond the program uh, to continue to move toward either NIST 171 DFARS compliance or CMMC Level 3 compliance? Uh, the first thing is you still have to have that full SSP. You've got to make sure that you are uh, documenting everything, uh, that you have you know, all the information about both your cloud environment, your on-prem environment, your endpoints. All of that has to be documented in the SSP with the appropriate uh, scope around it. Um, you know, when you're looking at migrating into these platforms, um, there's still migration to deal with and endpoints to deal with. So there's a lot that you have to do, um, you know, a work that you have to do around um, that kind of uh, that kind of uh, project. Um, there's additional configuration going to be required for Azure. Even if you lay down these blueprints, uh, like Richard said, you're going to have to, you know, close the gap between that 50 to 60% configuration and the actual fully compliant configuration that's going to meet all of your specific needs for features and infrastructure um, as you're deploying these things out. Um, the configuration for Office 365, you know, as Richard said earlier, the, uh, the compliance manager today is really a reporting tool. Um, you know, there's going to be a movement long term to to add in some configuration capability linking to configuration items and those kinds of things. Uh, but you're still going to have to execute the configuration of the Office 365 environment. Is that is that accurate, Richard? It is. And, and you know, there's I would say an opportunity for, for Microsoft and, and our partners to work to come together on, for example, templates for data protection policies that are reusable across multiple organizations. So you'll find that there are components of Office 365 where we can be able to have like uh, community or, or, or industry led uh, solutions, especially for Office 365 and protection of controlled unclassified information that's over email with data loss prevention, uh, prevention capabilities and so forth, labeling capabilities. But yeah, the configuration for Office 365 is uh, manual at this point in time, and and uh, we'll take a community effort to really get to, I'd say, a consensus on how you would, for example, label CUI effectively right. outside of Office 365. Okay, great. Thank you. So, you know, for the next point I have here is really about, you know, the full scope reporting against level three. Um, you know, there's a lot that has to be done. Process, procedure, um, you know, the maturity level processes, all of those still have to be done. Um, this is not going to provide that for you. So, um, you know, none of that, the documentation outside of what eventually may happen with, you know, kind of the SSP output as an input to your SSP outside of that, all of the other stuff is still going to have to be done. Um, you know, this acceleration program is not going to help you there um, as, as there's no way it could. Um, and then, you know, the ongoing management and reporting pieces, um, you know, 
everybody, you know, our customers, you know, right now, everybody is really focused on getting this, these platforms configured appropriately, uh, getting, you know, into the platform, using the platform right off the bat. But the ongoing management and reporting of these infrastructures, um, that's going to be the next hurdle that people have to, to grapple with is, okay, I've gotten into the platform. It's functional. It's secured. I've built it correctly. I've, I've built my SSP. I got my procedures and policies. Now I have to do that day-to-day -day ongoing management of the environment. Um, and how are you going to do that? Do you do that in-house? Do you leverage an MSSP? Do you leverage an MSP to help you with that? Um, that is going to have to still be, uh, have to still be uh, tackled, right? So what are we doing at Summit 7? How are we going to leverage this uh, specific product and, or this um, capability, this tool set? We are going to in, uh, fully integrate the acceleration program into all of our projects. So um, as we are uh, revving our projects and we do go con through constant uh, revs of our projects uh, for configuration as new products are deployed into the Microsoft platform, um, as things change with configuration requirements and compliance requirements, we'd rev those products. And as part of that, we're going to integrate this whole capability into that. And what that might do is it, a, might, it is going to allow us to quick, get to a configured environment uh, potentially quicker, um, which hopefully results in some cost savings uh, for our customers long term. Um, and But I think the biggest impact is going to be on deliverables. Uh, because we're now going to be able to provide more detailed, uh, more rich deliverables um, based on the data that we're going to be able to pull out of the platforms using Compliance Manager, um, using potentially this SSP, uh, you know, export capability for the configuration. Uh, you know, we do provide some of that today, all of that today, uh, but it's not as automated. And so it's a more manual process, which obviously, you know, that should eventually end up, uh, you know, bringing costs down of, of these projects and the timeline to deploy, uh, which is great. Um, and then, you know, beyond the configuration and implementation component, uh, this is going to help us dramatically on the managed services side uh, for updates and reporting capabilities. So we're going to be able to get a lot more information out of the tenants using these tool sets uh, than we're able to get today. Um, you know, from a security standpoint, from a from a monitoring standpoint, um, using Defender and using Azure Security Center, uh, very excited about what we're able to do uh, with with the acceleration program uh, and, and what's coming out of the acceleration program for uh, the ongoing support pieces. Um, so uh, what are our next steps? We're about out of time here. I think we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to send email to uh, CMMC. Um, uh, to the CMMC email address there. Uh, we have um, we have to continue uh, the efforts that we have in place. Obviously, the SPRS November 30th deadline is out there. Everybody's trying to get everything ready for that November 30th deadline. So continue on that path. Do what you're doing uh, to, to close whatever gaps you have left and get those reports done correctly uh, for SPRS. Um, be on the lookout for the continued updates for the CMMC, CMMC acceleration program. They're going to continue to roll out over the next, uh, you know, the next year. Uh, additional capabilities coming out. Integrate those into your processes and procedures. Integrate those into your infrastructure and leverage the capability. It's great capability that Microsoft's providing, and, and you should really take advantage of it. Um, don't forget about your uh, on-premises and other cloud services configurations. Um, you know, obviously, if you're doing on-prem, you're fully responsible for that. You've got to do all of this, you know, kind of work there, documenting it and such. If you're in other cloud services, um, then, you know, you're going to have to get these same kinds of capabilities uh, in those other cloud services. And so you got to make sure that you're focused on that, too. Um, and then, you know, one of the last points I want to make is don't forget the policy and procedure piece of this. OK, um, there there are you know lots of people out there that can help you if you need help. Um, with uh, documenting your policies and procedures, uh, getting those maturity level processes identified, uh, writing those up, making sure that you're following them. And, and it's more than just writing them up and, 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 and having them on a shelf. It's integrating them into your infrastructure, integrating them into your way of doing business, into the culture of your organization. This is a sea change in how most organizations are managing data. And so we have to uh, drive all of these new processes and procedures into the fabric of the organization Otherwise, uh, we're going to end up in, uh, in a situation where uh, we're not actually doing the things that we need to do to maintain the environments once they get in place. OK, um, with that, I think that's uh, that's my last slide for today. We're going to jump in and do a couple questions. Uh, like I said, we did get a lot of questions uh, throughout throughout the presentation, um, but I want to uh, get as many of these as we can. And uh, and Sean, you have some questions uh, teed up for us. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> Let's see here. Let me uh, make a comment really quick. Uh, yeah, go for it, Richard. We've been noticing that we've had uh, kickbacks for people emailing the CMMC at Microsoft.com. Uh, <clears throat> we, I'm trying to ser service that on the back end to find out why that distribution group is uh, currently broken. If, if you uh, if, if you are unable to get through on CMMC at Microsoft.com, I hope to have that resolved today. Uh, but you can all you can always reach out to me to my uh, my email address is my first name dot last name at microsoft.com so richard dot wakeman at microsoft.com and and uh, <clears throat> you can use that in lieu of the CMMC alias. Yeah, you heard it here, folks. Uh, send as many emails as you can to richard dot wakeman at microsoft.com. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> so getting into some of these questions, um, I thought this was interesting, Richard. Um, this one's going to be for you. Do you think Microsoft will offer a certification course of any kind uh, in, as a part of this acceleration program? So there is a lot of discussion around readiness, both for our partner community, as well as even potentially in, in uh, looking at how even C3PO, the, the assessors, would be cloud ready for being able to understand how to score and uh, understand reciprocity and everything on, on the, the, on the cloud service uh, provider. And that's not just specifically unique to Microsoft. Uh, you know, there's that challenge, I believe for, for any assessor understanding uh, how to, how to go in and, and uh, assess a, a, you know, a customer that's running in the, in the cloud. So the short answer is yes, we have we have training that's coming out that we will target for customers and partners here uh, within by the end of this year. Uh, and then we're also in discussions with, for example, the, the CMMC accreditation body and what it would look like to uh, to build training or to have supplementary training even for assessors and uh, registered provider organizations. All right. Awesome. Next question is what, uh, so, so many folks have asked, okay, November 30th, that's looming. I need to get um, through some of the DFARS requirements and some of the reporting requirement requirements uh, for DFARS 20, uh, 7019 and 7020. Mm -hmm. What are some things that companies can begin using now for GCC high? <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, if you look at uh, GCC high being, specifically the productivity suite. Uh, you know, we, we have been working on and have, of course, uh, materials that around how we demonstrate compliance for NIST 800-171. Uh, there's the compliance manager with the assessment templates that will come to GCC High here in the next uh, month or so. So those, those will become available. Uh, in terms of looking at, uh, <clears throat> you know, the the, the the full picture there's there are a number of those reference architectures that i mentioned that we're in currently in development of that will will extend out into 2021 so we'll we'll have more announcements as those evolve uh, as part of the cmmc acceleration program okay awesome let's see here from a licensing standpoint Compliance manager uh, currently limited to E5 subscriptions. Um, is there a chance that some of the compliance manager features will eventually be a part of E3, um, et cetera, or an add-on situation? Yeah, I, I've, I've been getting that question quite a bit. I, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I don't necessarily, you know, deal with licensing as much. I will say this: it's it's not a license required per user in order to use the compliance manager, right? There needs to be a license for E5 to be able to enable that capability. Uh, so the way that, that I would typically rationalize it is that for you to, um, you know, have uh, access to the compliance manager with the assessment templates that your administrators that would be using it would of course be licensed for E5. Okay. I think one of the last questions that we've gotten several different versions of it has a lot to do with your blog, Richard. Uh, and that is as far as from platforms and how to choose, which, um, first question, we'll keep it CMMC and then we'll go DFARS and really CUI requirements. 
Um, can you meet level three compliance? And as you guys have, have continued to work towards uh, the program and all the various pieces, parts of the program, can you meet CMMC level three requirements via the Microsoft 365 commercial platform or within mm -hmm. that version of the platform? So, you know, in terms of looking at CMMC, it is a set of practices, especially in alignment with uh, with NIST 800 that can you can demonstrate compliance with CMMC in, in any of the clouds, right? I mean, that's why you even have like a requirement for, you know, DFAR 7012 that says FedRAMP moderate or equivalent, right? So what's the definition right. of that and how would that be enforced by uh, assessors? Uh, you know, I wrote a full article uh, rationalizing some of this is based on, you know, an argument for protecting controlled and classified information. There's no definition that's outlined in CMMC that would differentiate between, for example, CM, uh, sorry, QE basic versus QE specified, such as those that would be export controlled data. Right. And, and at the end of the day, if you're looking at protecting controlled and classified information to the higher watermark, then naturally that would have to include uh, export control data. So that would be in ITAR. Uh, if you were to look at becoming compliant with ITAR uh, within the commercial side environment, it is fully your scope of responsibility. You will not get a contractual obligation from Microsoft to protect ITAR data. We will only provide that. in uh, our U.S. Sovereign Cloud, which is Microsoft 365, GCC High, and, and Azure Government, where we know that all of our backend systems are continental United States, CONUS. Uh, the networks are restricted to CONUS. We've got only screened U.S. persons, in fact, citizens that manage that environment. So that's how we're able to get to the IL-5 plus no foreign requirements and, and have a contractual obligation for it. So. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of discussion have been around uh, how to potentially protect ITAR data in the commercial side environment. Uh, you know, if you look, if you use, for example, uh, you know, encryption, maybe third party encryption and, and that uh, that would be applied on, for example, documentation before it's stored in the cloud. So it's uh, opaque to the cloud service provider. There may be a path for you to demonstrate compliance for ITAR and commercial but it's full year scope of responsibility, right? It's not something that, that uh, Microsoft is going to give you a cookbook on how to become ITAR compliant and commercial, right? Right. All right, well, I think that more or less covers it. And thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.